In this segment, we're going to close out our discussion of ethics and discuss the ways in which some of the systems we've talked about can be used for bad ends. They can just be used unethically. Now, in many ways, this is the clearest way in which uh, these systems can kind of run up against problems in the real world, but I think it's worth going through some of the examples that we've seen from this, and you've probably seen or have others in mind yourself. So one kind of long-standing issue with language technology is its ability to be used for surveillance. The idea of more deeply understanding text allows us to do things like crawl social media and understand what kinds of things people are saying. And this allows, let's say, authoritarian regimes to keep tabs on uh, who's expressing dissent or negative views about the government or things like that. And this is not really hypothetical. There are quite a few uh, Department of Defense funded programs that are essentially trying to use this kind of large scale text mining. Another interesting case came up uh, during net neutrality debates several years ago where there were a large number of comments that were posted that were against net neutrality that were found to be generated from this basically templated uh, kind of schema, sort of like a Mad Lib. Now, these were possible to detect, but with new and better systems like ChatGPT, Will that necessarily be possible going forward? There's a large conversation around AI watermarking and can we uh, mark text that gets generated by these language models and then detect it later? And can you circumvent a watermark if you're sufficiently sophisticated? So there's a kind of question about what sort of harms would arise if these things are undetectable. Another issue that comes up is the ability of us is our ability to take data that is de-identified or anonymized and then somehow reverse that process or de-anonymize it and actually figure out who this is talking about. So here we're showing uh, kind of, uh, you know, the ability to do this in the forward direction, but what we haven't established is that, you know, this stuff cannot be de-anonymized in this case. And there's a kind of other, a related issue is authorship attribution. If we have text that's written by an anonymous author, can we actually figure out who wrote it? This is actually a very old application of NLP that dates back uh, a number of years and people have looked at with respect to Shakespeare and the Federalist Papers and things like that. Uh, but of course, trying to figure out who is writing things that are being put forth by some anonymous account online, let's say, uh, is a kind of big social issue. Another uh, interesting example that came up within the past few years was this work by Wong and Kosinski looking at classifying people as gay versus straight based on photos of their face. Now, the authors of this study argued that they were testing a hypothesis that sexual orientation has this genetic component which is actually reflected in your appearance. So, the idea that you could have a gay versus straight detector is something which is a little bit fraught because there are many places in the world where it's not legal to be gay. And you can imagine that such places would use this, these tools to, let's say, arrest people and throw them in jail. So they were claiming, well, that wasn't our intention. We were just kind of doing the science. However, there was some recent work, uh, so there was some subsequent work, a blog post by Agara Yarkas, Todorov, and Mitchell, which showed that you could actually completely influence these systems by doing things like changing facial hair or putting on or taking off glasses. So it turns out that the kind of scientific benefit of this was pretty nebulous in that it wasn't even really good science. And the dangers of unethical use in this case maybe outweigh any potential benefits we get from that. Now, of course, large language models bring up a whole separate set of ways in which they can be used unethically. Uh, this is still emerging and there's only starting to be now some cases where we've actually seen this uh, kind of documented in practice or studied systematically. Uh, but things like AI generated misinformation campaigns, uh, whether it's intentional, like someone means to spread this or actually the system just returns the wrong answer about something and lots of people believe that. Uh, 
Of course, there's a whole conversation around education, like can students use this for essays, things like that. To what extent is this plagiarism versus not? Uh, and then simply, this is a powerful tool. If you can do, if it enables you to do things better, that has benefits, but also downsides, right? Like you can help people learn how to build bombs more effectively. So there's also just a general sense in which these are a very powerful system. And when you have a powerful system, that has the effect in many instances of concentrating power. For example, large tech companies that have these models now have an advantage over other companies that don't and are likely to become wealthier and more powerful in society. Is this necessarily what we want or not? Now, we've talked a lot about the kind of thorns here. There are a lot of proposed ways to actually improve the situation and move things forward. So, uh, there's various different frameworks you can use to think about how you should behave when designing and building systems. There's a proposed code of ethics from a few years ago by Hal Domey, uh, which outlines a number of points that you can think about basically contributing and positively benefiting society uh, and minimizing the negative consequences of your systems, trying to make sure that your results are interpreted correctly, um, and sort of other guidelines like that. Value-sensitive design is another framework that it's a way of thinking about when you're going to build a system, whose values do you need to account for? How do you engage those people in the process? And how do you make sure you build something that's really what people want? A lot of the efforts also revolve around documentation. For example, data sheets and also model cards. And these are ways of saying that one of the cheapest things that we can do is just have better descriptions of what's in our data. So we understand when we train systems on this, for example, from the framework of value-sensitive design, whose values do they reflect and how are they going to actually uh, kind of propagate certain value systems over others. And finally, there's a lot of thinking about uh, auditing of systems. This is a, from a paper by Deb Raji et al. called Closing the AI Accountability Gap, which outlines ways of actually breaking down all the different steps of an algorithmic audit and applying these to an AI system to try to figure out where this is going to do well and where it's not going to do well. So the good news is that uh, there are some uh, there is kind of evidence in the things that have been released with GPT-4 that companies like OpenAI are taking some of these steps and doing some of the kind of testing before just releasing tools widely onto the world. Uh, but I think it's widely viewed within the community that there's more that we can do to improve these processes and make things better. So I encourage you as you take the tools that you've learned about how to use in this course that you think about looking at these systems, evaluating the work that you do critically from these lenses, and make sure that what you're building has a positive impact on society. That's the end of this segment.